Our trials in life can be turned into testimonies that we can use to share our faith and bring glory to God. Even pain and loss can be turned into hope and healing. It tells us in the scripture in Romans chapter 5, so we glory in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. We've got two ladies who are living out that passage in their real lives right now. And they're here to share because they want to be able to impact the kingdom of Christ. Megan, Robin, thank you for being here and your willingness to want to share the tough trials that you have gone through together. In fact, your stories are so parallel in what you've experienced and also in the time in which they happened. So you both have gone through something that no parent ever hopes to endure, and that is losing a child. You were to find out that God put you together beforehand for a greater purpose, first uniting you as sisters in Christ. So tell us how you know each other. How are you connected? Well, we come from a small town where everyone knows everyone. And at our church, we really um, have spent a lot of time together there. My husband, Brandon, is the pastor of children and youth. And he's also an ambassador for FCA. And with Megan and Scott, we got to know them through our children's ministry, where their daughter Aubrey has plugged in and, and participates in some of the activities there. So Megan, about two years ago, you're a new mom and you find out you're expecting other child. So we found out we were having a boy, very exciting, not a lot of boys in our family. Um, and we go to our anatomy scanning and they look concerned about what they're seeing. The images, they, originally they said they didn't think they had clear enough images. So out of precautionary measures, we were gonna get moved to MUSC um, to where we found out that the worst that we were expecting was kind of what our reality was about to become. Um, we got to MUSC and they confirmed that the diagnosis could potentially be fatal, but it was almost kind of tiptoed around at some points. Um, we talked to the doctors and were under the understanding that he would endure surgery when he was born. Um, he had a whole team of doctors with the fetal care center. And once he was born, potentially they would have to take him, do surgery, but that we would ultimately be coming home is kind of our understanding from that point. So you get some really tough news. How did you handle it at that point and then going forward? So when we got the fatal diagnosis, um, that word just kept kind of sticking with me. Uh, we would come home and we would get to our hallway and his nursery was at the end on the left. And um, when you would stand in the hall and look into his room and question, how are you gonna come home empty handed? How do you walk by that room knowing that he, he's not gonna be there? So that was, those thoughts started going through my mind and a part of me was kind of thinking, I have the mentality that I pray for the best, but I'm gonna prepare for the worst. So in my mind, I kind of thought that was just me preparing myself, um, but little did I know that he was actually preparing me. So Robin, your friend is walking through a really tough journey. As a woman of faith, how do you support her? It ultimately went to prayer. We prayed so hard for Weston and for Megan and Scott, as they were walking through the pregnancy, we would get updates after their appointments and would just be in such a spirit of prayer for them. And I'll never forget the day that Weston was born. Um, we waited by the phone and we were waiting for updates and we just prayed. We prayed so hard for his little life and, and that God would work in such a mighty way. We were limited by the pandemic. We couldn't physically be there for them. Um, we were able to physically be there in the days and weeks to come after they came home but I just remember praying so fervently for them. So Megan, it's time for Weston to be born. <laughs> and he's born and there's no cry. Right, um, up to that point, I, I just remember talking to God and saying, God, if it is your will for him to live and him to be healthy, he's gonna come out crying. You know, he's going to defy the odds. He is going to be okay and if it is your will for him not to live, then he won't, and, and I want you to prepare us for that. Give us that peace that we will be able to endure the trials to come from this. You did, when we were talking, you said that at that moment, God gave you a peace that came over you. Share a little more about that. 
So when they let us know that they had pretty much done everything that they could do for him at that point, um, it was right within 24 hours of the restrictions being implemented at the hospital for visitors. And thankfully, we were able to get my parents and my husband's mom and sister in to meet, meet Weston and say their goodbyes um, before everything kind of got shut down. And in that moment, um, we were surrounded by family. Doctors and nurses were coming in, and they were beginning to unplug him. And he was laid out in my lap. And I can just remember the anxiousness of trying to figure out how his last breath was going to happen, what, what was going to happen in the next few moments or hours. And I just remember this peace coming over me. And it was like everything in the room just stood still. And I could just hear him saying, I didn't bring this pain without purpose. You know, in Romans 8.18, it says, the pain that you're experiencing is nothing short of the joy to come. So knowing that he has that promise for us, it, it just... It's unfathomable. It really is a peace that passes all understanding. Amen. So, Robin, <clears throat> clearly a, just a tough, enduring time that your friend is going through. And <clears throat> how do you draw on your faith? What do you, what do, you do to support her? We, we prayed, and we prayed really, really fervently for them through this time. So your life is going well. Your friend is um, coming along, and you're helping her. And yeah. You have three boys and everything's going fine. And then when you least expect it, guess what? Surprise, you're having a girl, but there's some other news. Yes. Yeah, so in January of this year, we learned that our family was growing and we have three boys, ages 15, 13, and 10. So we were just processing the fact that we have a baby on the way. Mm -hmm. When we go in in April for our growth and anatomy scan, we received the best news that we were going to be adding a girl but almost simultaneously we learned that there were genetic markers that were very concerning to the doctors that day. So they recommended that we do a genetic screener that would give us more information. And upon doing the screener, we learned that the results came back positive for trisomy 13. And so that became a very unknown world for us. That was a diagnosis where at first we were anticipating Down syndrome. Um, trisomy 13 was just very different. And we learned very quickly um, in the medical world that it's described as incompatible with life. Mm. So the doctors are telling you death, right. but you and Brandon see life still. Yes. So we immediately entered the world of specialists. And um, we actually had some of the same team members yeah. as Megan and Scott whenever we went to Charleston. And so through that process, our very first appointment, as we sat down with a genetic counselor, the very first thing that was recommended to us was abortion. And, and that was not an option for us. We did not want to terminate the pregnancy despite a diagnosis. And at that point, the diagnosis wasn't even confirmed. So that day, we did decide to move forward with further testing um, that was a little invasive to, to get a diagnosis. And it was confirmed. It was confirmed that she did have trisomy 13. Um, she was fully affected. And so things really changed in that moment. We, um, despite a life-limiting diagnosis, despite being said to expect a stillbirth, Brandon and I were watching a baby grow and thrive. And every ultrasound that we had, every, um, to the point of every week, every time that we went to the doctor, we're hearing expect death but we were feeling life and we knew that God was the creator of her life and the sustainer of her life. And we just trusted him and had so much hope for time and just prayed for time with her. So Megan, now your friend is going through mm -hmm. almost the same thing you went through and, and not too much time later. How do you turn now to help her out? Um, at this point, it was, it was becoming clear to me that this was part of the purpose behind everything with Weston. Um, it was now time for me to walk with her and kind of, you know, my journey in a sense of the medical team at MUSC and Weston's care, my journey had ended with that and hers was just beginning. Mm -hmm. So where I had just walked, she was just beginning mm -hmm. her stage with this. Yeah. And I kind of took it as a, you know, we were talking about the other day that somebody's life could potentially be your survival guide. Mm -hmm. Somebody's Everything that they have gone through could be your hope for your situation. 
So at that point, I just knew that it was time for me to walk alongside her and prepare her for what the doctors could face and just what this journey was going to bring for them. It's so true. Like they say that like God goes before us. Right. He had gone before in your trial so that you can go and help out your friend. So Robin, it's time for Anna Grace. And Anna Grace is born. And despite all the things that the doctors had told you, you've got a healthy girl and she's doing well. And, and God gives you two days with her yes. and everything as well. And um, as you two days are going by and then things suddenly turn quickly. Yes. So at 37 weeks on September 3rd, um, we welcomed Anna Grace into our world. And so it was a very unknown time as we were told to expect a stillbirth. We were told to, that she may not survive through the rigor of labor. And we just knew that our time with her was so unknown but God just gave us a miracle. She was born breathing. The respiratory distress that was predicted at her birth didn't happen. We had a breathing, crying baby, and she was assessed by the NICU team, and they um, you know, treated her as a typical newborn. So Brandon and I were just so, we, we were so thrilled to have time with her. And for two days, we cherished every moment, every second with that baby because we knew that she did have a life-limiting diagnosis, but yet we knew that ultimately God was in control. And so um, they were preparing us on September 5th to come home. And as they walked in and were making arrangements to discharge us, God had other plans. Anna Grace did go into respiratory distress. And the day that we were planning to bring her home, she walked into her heavenly home. Mm -hmm. so. We talked a lot about time. Yeah. Time um, in our humanly mind for two days is short. Yeah. but. That redefined time for you. Share about that. Yes, it did. Um, you know, as women, we face, sometimes we feel bound by time. You know, we are, we have jobs and we have schedules and we have um, families and we have relationships. And I think about my children and their sports schedules and just, just the, the schedule of a week and how um, we can just get so bound. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. And Anna, Grace, and Weston really redefined time for us. They taught us the value of an hour. Right. They taught us the value of a moment, the value of a second, the value of a day. And um, going back to Psalms 90, 12, um, that scripture tells us to teach us to number our days so that we may have a heart of wisdom. And I will forever look at time differently after the two days that I had. As believers, uh, for women who might be listening and, and hey, this is, this is their story. How do you encourage them with hope through these trials and loss that you've endured? How do you encourage someone else going through that? What would, how would you point them to Christ? Well, just like you said with hope, um, surrounding yourself by people who are constantly praying you through your situations and your circumstances because as Christians, we know that this is not it. This is just temporary. Eternity is, is what we are striving for, and that is what God promises us. So if you're also surrounded by people who are breathing that positivity into you and that hope and knowing that what this diagnosis is is not where it ends. Even if he's unhealthy now, he will be healthy in heaven, and you will get to spend eternity with him. So for us, we had less than a day, and Robin and Brandon had two days, we have eternity waiting Absolutely. on us. Amen. Absolutely. So very shortly after our journey began, I was reminded by a sweet friend of Romans 8.28 that tells us that um, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And we have to cling to that, that all things, even death and death and life, God is working all things for our good. And knowing that He goes ahead of us, knowing that He gives us eternity, um, that just gives us such precious promises to cling to that fuel that hope. You ladies are such an inspiration to, to me, to those listening, to people who are just wondering, how do they do it? How do they, how do they have that faith and strength? And clearly, as believers, that's where your hope lies. It's not here. It's not in, yes. it's not in this time and now. We talk about time. It's that in eternal time. So right. as you both continue to heal, um, we're going to be praying for you both and also praying that through your 
tribulations, through these trials that you've experienced, that others might come to know the Lord. Yes. And we just thank you so much for sharing your heart. Absolutely. Thanks for allowing us yeah, to thank share. thank you.